About days after, eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter and John and James with him, and he went up a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became a, as bright as a flash of lightning. And two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his Departure, an interesting word for his crucifixion and resurrection. They spoke of his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment. Other interesting words about crucifixion and resurrection, bringing something to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as the men were leaving, Jesus, leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. Ah, uh, three, uh, three forms to hold these three magnificent icons of human beings. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And it says in parentheses, he did not really know what he was saying. <laughs> while, while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered into the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to Him. And when the voice is spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. Moses and Elijah were gone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus was alone. It had the word fulfillment in there. He was alone because he himself was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He alone was the son of God. He alone was the one who brought the good news. Listen to this. This is from uh, a, fellow named, a minister named John Killinger who wrote a book called, uh, let me see, he wrote a book called uh, ten, 10 Things I Learned Wrong from a uh, Conservative Church. We're not going to go through all 10 of them today. We're not going to go through any of them, actually. We're just going to read something interesting that he said. When I was growing up, we heard about Jesus in every service of worship, but no distinction was ever offered between his understanding of God and the understanding of God in the Old Testament, in Moses, Elijah, all the prophets, the whole of the Old Testament. No, he never in all of his life growing up in the church heard any distinction made between Jesus and the way God is taught, between God in the Old Testament and the way Jesus talked about God. Because the, the Bible was regarded as a monolithic book, a whole thing, all of itself. As they used to say back in the country where I come from, kiver to kiver. All literally equally inspired. It never occurred to our ministers and teachers that biblical concepts might have changed between the time of Abraham and Moses in the Old Testament and Jesus and the disciples in the New Testament. 
So the Jesus we got was a Jesus who was said to proclaim exactly the God of ancient Judaism. The one who laid down all of those harsh punishments in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and often encouraged the Jews to destroy even the wives and children of their enemies. Now let me tell you something. It is the, it is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Covenant, it is the difference in which the gospel of Jesus Christ lies. That is where the good news is. Now, there are plenty of passages in the Old Testament which uh, look forward to the coming of the Messiah. But there is not any place in the Old Testament in which the gospel, the good news that Jesus brought is proclaimed. There is not a place in any other ancient literature in which the good news of the gospel that Jesus brought was proclaimed. Let me tell you something weird. Uh, how many of you, I'm going to look back at some people in the choir how many of you remember Jerry Falwell? I'm checking to see whether Blake and Shannon have their hands up. He, oh, he knows who he is, but he doesn't remember. It was before his time. Most of us remember Jerry Falwell. He's the one who started mixing up politics and religion with the moral majority. He's the one that helped get us into the mess where we are now where if you're a conservative Christian, you belong generally to one political party, and if you're a progressive Christian, you belong to another political party. This is the one who got us into the situation that we're in now, Jerry Falwell, or he helped to do it with his moral majority. Uh, someone did a study of five years of Jerry Falwell's sermons, and he discovered that including the scripture with which the sermon began and all of the references in the sermon, over 90% of all of his references were to Old Testament passages. Can you imagine that? 90% of the passages referred to by a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is about material that was written before Jesus Christ ever came into this world. That's kind of astounding. <laughs> Let me talk more about that difference. I don't know whether you know it or not, but uh, according to the folks that Jesus talked to all the time, you would have no, now, let me, let me make sure that, that we are not referring in any way to the, uh, to the Jewish faith of today. We're not. We were talking about the Jewish faith of our Lord's time. There would be no way in which you would have any chance of entering the kingdom of heaven. No way. Why is that? You're not Jewish. You're Gentiles. I'm sorry to call you something strange, but you're, that's what you are. I don't get up in the morning thinking, hey, I'm a Gentile. <laughs> but the Jewish people <laughs> divided the world into Jews and Gentiles, and you were either one or the other. There were some people then who thought maybe Gentiles might have a place in the kingdom. But if they had a place, it would be serving them, you would have a place of service. It would be like uh, slavery. Um, so there would be no place for us in the kingdom. Now, there were other people that had no chance of salvation either. 
if you had in any way made yourself like a Gentile, you would not be able to enter heaven. For example, if you were a tax collector. Now, I'm, you know, it's tax time. We're not, we're not happy with the tax collector. I'm happy with the nice lady who helps me do my taxes, but she doesn't get my taxes. Uh, and I'm glad, I'm actually glad to pay taxes because somebody has to do it because uh, someone's got to pay the government. It's like as a church, uh, we send a certain portion of our income uh, to, to run the conference. It not, it's not just St. Matthew United Methodist Church. It's a larger world out there. Um, and, uh, and so the Jewish people, though, were very unhappy to pay taxes because they went to the Roman authorities who had occupied the country. It's as if we paid taxes and they were sent to Mexico. Or it was as if Canada had conquered America and we paid taxes and they went to Canada. Or Putin had conquered America and we paid taxes and they went to Putin. Now, you would be very unhappy about that. The Jewish people pay taxes, and it had to go to the Roman authorities who ruled the country because they had overrun it and had taken it. And now, what the Roman authorities did, they got tax collectors from the Jewish people because they were there on the spot, and they already knew what people had and what people could pay. And so the tax collectors collected the taxes. The Jewish tax collectors collected the taxes for the Roman authorities and they could set any amount they wanted to. They were completely independent. So if they wanted to get wealthy, which all of them did, they would simply up your taxes and they would get the extra and the rest of it would go to Rome. These were hated people, absolutely hate. They were the most hated people in society. And they were considered to be beyond the mercy of God. They had made themselves like Gentiles, therefore they could not, they couldn't get into the heaven. Can you imagine what a stir it caused when people became aware that Jesus had called a tax collector uh, named Levi in the scriptures, but possibly Matthew, but had called a tax collector to be among his followers. I want us to understand why they put him on that cross. Because that would be about the most radical thing any person could do. There was a little story that used to go around that people were familiar with. Oh, by there was another, there was another group of people that had no chance. That's swinards, people who had anything to do with pigs. They could not get into heaven. They were out. Out and gone. Um, because pigs were a forbidden food for the Hebrew people. So those two people and uh, prostitutes, excuse me for talking about delicate things, uh, uh, prostitutes who had only Jewish people at, as clients could be reformed, but if they had Gentiles as clients, they could not be reformed and had no chance of getting into heaven. And there may have been other categories, but there are three of them, people who could not, and Gentiles in, in general, and, and those three categories among the Jews who could not get into heaven. And Jesus told that story, the prodigal son. Now, what most people don't know, there was another little story told by rabbis that was similar to the story of the prodigal son. It was not the masterpiece that Jesus told. It was just a simple thing about a, a, a boy who said to his father, let me have my inheritance, that he made a journey into a far country, just like the prodigal son, and he wasted his money, and his father sent a servant after him to go and get him and bring him home, and uh, the boy said, I can't go home because uh, I have offended my father, and the guy said, yes, you can come home because you are his son, and he is your father. So you can see the similarity. There's nothing like the second half of Jesus' parable but a similarity to the, to the first half of Jesus' parable. But notice what Jesus does. Jesus, I started to call this sermon the audacity of God, uh, of Jesus, the offensiveness of Jesus, because he seemed to deliberately push people to the point where they might well want to throw rocks at him. 
And he talked about one time why he spoke in parables. He spoke in parables, I think, because by the time people figured out what it was, he was already out of there. Okay? So in his parable, the boy just doesn't just go into a far country. First of all, there are two sons because he's going to talk about another group of people with the second son. But the first boy, the youngest son, asks for his inheritance, wastes it, spends it, is destitute. And notice what Jesus does. He makes him a what? Someone who deals with what? Pigs. He makes him a swineherd, deliberately. Makes him a swineherd. Makes him incompatible with the kingdom of God. Someone who cannot be saved at all. And, and Jesus has him come home and has the father run to meet the boy. And the father does three things. He puts on him three things. The first thing he says, put a, tells the servants to put a robe on him. That's a symbol of the fact that he is the honored guest of this party they're just about to have. The second thing he says is put a ring on him. That ring was a senate ring. Uh, Norman Perrin, the theologian, suggested these that I'm talking about now. A senate ring, which you used as a stamp when you filled out an official document, giving him the authority of the father. And the next thing he said was put shoes on his feet, meaning that he was a member of the family. He was not a slave. How offensive could one man get in talking to people who did not believe anything that he was saying and did not see the world in this way? Obviously, the people who are going to respond to this are those who see themselves as sinners and outside the kingdom with no way back and those who have not done it the way they should and the people who have strived to do it right like the older brother, they're going to, they're going to be really upset with Jesus. And they were. You know, two of the most, one of the most dangerous things you can talk about with people is religion. It shouldn't be, but it is. And one of the most, and one of the saddest things about the Christian faith, and anyway, because, because our Lord was stepping on their religious toes, that's one reason they got so mad. This, one of the sad things about the Christian faith is that we have actually adopted that old exclusive attitude. There are churches who believe that uh, everyone who belongs to another church, another denomination, does not belong to their church, is going to hell. There are certainly Christians who believe that all people of other religions, whether they're uh, Mormon or uh, Muslim or Jewish or Hindu, that they're all going to hell. The proclamation of the gospel is that all of our sins are forgiven. Did Jesus ever openly proclaim himself to be the Messiah? A lot of scholars want to say that no, he really didn't. He does in the Gospel of John, but in the Synoptic Gospels, it never even crossed his mind to tell people that he was the Messiah, that he was the one they'd been waiting for for years. But let me tell you something. The moment he said to anybody, your sins are forgiven, he proclaimed himself to be the Messiah. Because the only figure the Jewish people recognized as being able to forgive sins was God and the Messiah that was to come in his name. And one thing our Lord used to do is to go around and proclaim to people, your sins are forgiven. 
at our Ash Wednesday service this week, when you receive those ashes, you will be informed that your sins are forgiven. Sometimes, from time to time, this becomes very important to me. I want to tell you now, look back over your life. Don't just look at the sins, look at the mess ups, look at the mistakes. And I want to tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Now let me correct something. I said earlier in the sermon that Falwell helped to create a situation where most conservative Christians are in one political party and most progressive Christians are in another political party. And that's not entirely true. That's not entirely true. I think what, whatever political party we are in, we need to realize that we are neighbor to the person in the other political party. And we are children of God and beloved. And the sad thing about our situation today, it has actually divided the church along those lines. And that's a great, great sorrow. The voice from heaven said of our Lord, listen to him, listen to him. His message was radical. Love, which allows us to build no walls between us and the neighbor. Whether the neighbor is Muslim or Republican or Democrat or Jewish or French or whatever, no wall. All of us belong to God. Join me in prayer. Dear God of grace and glory, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for being with us in this moment now.